Um, there's a couple things, that, so we're clear on that. The other thing is, is there's this um, survey the chemistry department does that says, how do, do we do? Which is basically just, it's just, it won't take forever. Just go through, buzz through it. Uh, that's feedback for the chemistry department. We need that. Especially if we're in light of the exam you just took, you're actually withdrawing from the class today. There's a good chance you're not here if you're in that case. But we kind of need to know why you're withdrawing if you're withdrawing. That's that. Then the last part is I need my evaluation. Okay? They're anonymous, so I don't know who's writing them. So now's your chance to be like. <laughs> and this works both ways. I mean, it's good if you say, here's what's good, to be like, keep doing that, because I need demos, or I need a hand, real application, or I, whatever, or if you're like, you got to do something different with, bah, then I know that. If you don't tell me that, there's no way I'll know. It's very important. Is that OK? Your, the evaluations, just so you know, across the board, they're really important for our jobs. They're not, like, we. that's the only way we get feedback. And if somebody's doing a bad job, you should be evaluating. Like, it's critical that you do. Because that is really, literally, because it's not traced back to you, but it literally is the chance for the chair to go, oh my gosh, what is going on in that classroom? But if you don't ever say anything, then, people get by with whatever. So, you know, if you think I'm getting by with whatever, then please let my chair know so that she can flag me down and be like, hey buddy, get it fixed. Soon, <laughs> right? And that's important, I'm, I'm cool with that. It's happened, you know, I've had those, those come to Jesus talks, as they say. I've had those before, it's okay. It's been a minute, but at least, you know. When I was a high school teacher, you know, Way back when, I thought I was smarter than anybody in the room. And my principal had a few kind advice words for me. Like, you got to talk to parents. You got to get to class on time. You got, you know, kind of just common sense stuff. But it was good. I'm glad he talked to me. Made me a better employee. So it's good. All right. So on we go. Questions, cares, concerns. Did we cover everything? I think we got it. Okay. Let's start into this, shall we? So this is being recorded as well because we got uh, some people participating on WebEx. So I'll try and work on this board. You guys see it? It's, yeah, okay. All right. So that's what we'll do. I might use that very corner over there. Not much to work with, but. So again, these are kind of um, Lisa slides, but I've altered them with whatever things I wanted to add to it. But this is good. So. We're going to kind of go into a special kind of, sometimes protein. So there's something called enzymes. There, so this is too generic when it says enzymes are proteins. It says enzymes should, should sometimes be proteins. Sometimes they're protein-like. So the thing about an enzyme, I can't, at this point, right, you have the fundamentals of, if I looked at a carbohydrate, I'd know what I'd be looking for. What would I be looking for? I'm always reviewing this, because this is like the final test review, right, when I say this. Alcohol is all over the place, right? If I was looking for a lipid, I'd be looking for what in the structure? Long chains or, what's your hint? Better hint? No, third hint? Rings, which are also hydrocarbon chains, right? Yeah, yeah? Okay, then um, if you were looking for um, proteins and amino acids, what would you be looking for? Just something. Carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid in the amino acids, right? And what? since we're on the amino acid, then let's finish that. A carboxylic acid for sure, and what's the other piece that's on every amino acid? Mm -hmm. Amine, mm -hmm. which is NH. Usually in this case NH2, but I'm sorry, you know, we had to kind of elaborate and say sometimes in the blood, there, how does the NH2 look when it gets protonated? NH3 plus, so it's kind of weird, right? Same token, the carboxylic acid, when it's deprotonated in the blood, it looks like instead of being CO, you know, C, CO2, 
Oh. Yeah, it's got a minus hanging out on it, right? It's deprotonated. And I should probably draw that. So a normal carboxylic acid is like this. Just like any acid, right? It's got its acidic H on it, correct? But when it loses that H, what's left behind? Conjugate base, same thing. In, in the blood, this is deprotonated, so I'm trying to keep my hands from being totally inked up right from the get-go. There you go. There you go. Yep. So even though we're like that, that doesn't exactly look like carboxylic acid. It is. It's technically called a carboxylate. You know, it's the conjugate base of the carboxylic acid. All right. I, I wandered on that one. The next one is nucleic acid. That's the newer one you just learned. Well, it's got a lot of parts you're looking for. Name any of them. Any nucleic acid, RNA, DNA, these are common nucleic acids we should know, right? What's in there? Yeah, so she was saying UCAG, right? Or UCAT, right? What are those called? If you were to kind of back off those and you really look at the chemical structure, they're there. They're a base of some flavor. They're either a multi ring base, right? They're the pyridine or pyrimidine base, right? And what, how they're attached, just little, little functionality, little changes in those make them U, A, G, C, or U, right? That's what changes. So if you look at the structure of every one of them, they're slightly different, but they all have that multi-rings, two, two rings, right? Or one ring with the, the nitrogens built into the ring. And more than one nitrogen. Those are bases, we call them. One down. There's a few parts in these. It's the base, the R, which is the ribose, the sugar, is that what you're talking about? So we got a five carbon sugar based on ribose. Or if you have deoxyribose, right, what did I lose? One of the alcohol groups, right, of the many alcohols on that sugar. So that's the second part. So we've got a base, we've got a sugar, and a phosphate. And there you go. And those are the fundamental structure inside every um, nucleic acid. So it's probably, you know, like it, you'll see pictures, right? So if I'm seeing pictures, you'll be like, the lipids are easy to identify. Alcohols are easy to identify. Loss OHs, right? So proteins, amino acids, like it's getting a little more complicated, right? Because there's a lot more complexity. And then finally, nucleic acids is like, wow, you got, you're looking for a few things. But phosphate should draw your eye. I start seeing phosphate. And then that five ring sugar, then I'm like, okay. And then I got the ring with the nitrogens in it. It's like, okay, that's a nucleic acid of some flavor. Now back to the protein for a second though. A protein doesn't necessarily have carboxylic acids and amines anymore. What does it have? Yeah. Amides, which looks like this and this. got together. I was about to be silly and say, got together and had a baby. But that, it's kind of like they did. Because <laughs> what happened? Basically, we took what out of here? Between these two. And it's the thing that's always getting lost in these kind of bonds. Water. Water's out. And, in, and as a result, I made an amide. I'm going to put the H up here. Like, that's the one left over, right? The presence of that multi-amide group is really what makes protein, right? Then if you were more specific, that protein, the next thing that comes in line, either way, I get to the same thing because this just repeats over and over and over. What's next? See? Carbon. Yeah. Little iron, then hanging out down here is the famous 
we call it the R group, right? Which is not the R like we know in organic chemistry, which means a hydrocarbon chain. It's just the group on the side of the protein that makes it do what it does. It's a lot of things, right? We learn like 20 of them, right? Learn meaning we have the sheet in front of us so we can see the R group, right? Not like you have to memorize it. True? Is that making sense? Okay, cool. That was just kind of a long lead up to say, okay, now we're going to talk about enzymes today, which are and, and a lot of things actually. But when I say enzyme, you're not going to need to be, you're not going to have to look at a structure and go, oh, that's an enzyme. You'll know it because of its function. Okay? So, can anybody get me started on a, what an enzyme is? I mean, it's up there, but can you put that in your own words? Does it does, there's two marks to every enzyme. What does it do? <laughs> you're, you're right, you're, at, you're heading down the road. You're like, there's a receptor and something bind, right? And it's like, it's a shape, it's like Pac-Man, right? And it, yeah, right, that's all. That's what I've got in my head from biology, right? Same thing. What is it doing in there? I don't know. might help us. But what it, there are two functions that an enzyme is going to do. Can you read that and say, can you read word that to me if I didn't know words like catalyze and biochemical reactions? What? It breaks things apart. It breaks things apart. Puts, puts them together. But what's the enzyme piece of it? The energy to What's the it? word catalyst mean to you? Okay, you're, you're getting very warm. Like yeah, when we were playing that game, I'm getting warmer. I'm like, man, you're on fire. Yeah, help her out. It, it makes it happen, but what's the secret for the, the magic word? The energy. What about the energy? I'll give you that. You're close, but that's not really what we usually use as the word. But we can we can we can make it happen. What happens to the speed by which you get from here to Grand Junction? Like, what's the ma major obstacle between here and Grand Junction? It what? Speeds up a reaction. Speeds up a reaction. So it changes the time. Right? So, to get from here to Grand Junction, the problem is the big Rocky Mountains, right? I got to get over some passes. If I could wipe those out, I would lower the energy. That's one way to say it, but if you were saying it, means I get there faster. It'd be a tragic day, but if I wiped out the mountains and it was a flat rate, like just from here to Grand Junction, straight, boom, 80 miles an hour, you're there. It takes very little time. But when you have to do this, then all of a sudden it's like, man, this takes a long time. Correct? You with me now? Okay. So that's what we're doing in the body. We're, we're and then not not all wrong, breaking and forming. That's the key. All right, so let's start thinking about it from the molecule world. So, here's the simple, we'll just do a simple, we'll just pretend this is a biochemical reaction, whatever the reaction is. I'll just make a chemical you might actually know. These are two carbons. This is an alcohol, and this is a hydrogen. Anybody name that thing? Two carbons, get me started. F, and then I have an O and an H, what would you call that? Ethanol, this is ethanol. Aha, huh. so I have a drink of ethanol. Beer or wine, right, mixed drink, whatever. And something goes on in my body that this thing has to get popped loose and it does something that makes me feel kind of funny. <laughs> right? So the whole reaction, I'm very way oversimplifying. Right? I'm way oversimplifying. But, and actually if I was trying to be exact, and I, I don't know if I have the bones to it, it didn't work exact. Somehow in the process this pops loose, so I'd have to have these kind of bones. I didn't know that I was about to do this reaction, but there we go. I think I can wing it. I can hunt a few bars and wing it. Do do. Do do. Although 
I'm not sure. Yeah, that's probably about right. Okay, so what happens is I have to break this bond and then I have to make this bond. So that's called reduction. So it does some sort of reduction and it makes a, ooh, gosh, what would that be? It's a double bond to an O. And this thing, there's an H actually, the H is hanging out over here. Gosh, C double bond O with an H right next door. What is that organic stuff? You have to look at your functional book table maybe to see it, in, unless you had these memories we take out. Some people might have though. It's carbonyl group, right? Remember that? That's down a lot of structures, but somehow it makes that CH that's right next to that. What's that group called? CH with an H right there. I'm sorry, C double bond O, that's carbonyl, with that same carbonyl attached to just an H. Mm -hmm. Aldehyde, yeah. So this makes an, that's called ethanol, if you want the technical name, but that's kind of the stuff that makes you feel sick. It's almost a little poisonous, so this has to be detoxed. But in the progress, I don't know everything else that's involved, it somehow makes you a little woozy, all right? So all I know is this, I know that along the way, this, Right? So there's some bond breaking, bond forming going on, right? I gotta break, I gotta break this bond, and then it makes a double bond, and then somehow I gotta form a new bond. And that has to happen. Right? And so I know this is the byproduct that makes you feel sick. If you get too much of it built up, then you're like, ugh. Yes, the aldehyde afterwards, it actually makes you sick, and I don't know what's going on in between. That's a, that's a great question, so I'm missing a little biochemistry to answer that question. I just know this is the stuff that, if it builds up, it gives that alcohol poisoning, it could actually happen. Okay. Right? And that's also why people go, gosh, I feel hung over. So this stuff's cruising around your body going, oof, I don't like this, I gotta get rid of it. All right? But anyway, with all that for what we're doing right now, this is fun. Now I'm challenged because I kind of have to think about that. What happens that actually, right? But anyway, if we're talking about what you're talking about, break, right? You were the one saying breaking for me, or no? No. You? Breaking for me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> She's like, oh, we're, we're teammates. We'll hang together. That's right. Okay, so breaking for me, right? Then think about all the things that have to happen. I got to break this bond, I got to form this bond. And now I gotta form this bond, okay? So the whole secret to this about a catalyst is, and this is not gonna be in our slides, but I, this is stuff I teach my Chem 2 students because this is kind of an area I work there a lot, is what does a catalyst really do? So for all of us, we learn it speeds up the rate of a chemical reaction. It happens faster, that's one. How does it do it? By lowering the energy for the reaction. Lowering the, what they call the activation energy. So if I, if I graph this kind of reaction and I say, okay, this is energy. Oop, I'm over here. It's all right. If I said, okay, here's the energy. And I start here and I go, okay, my reactants start here. And I gotta get up and over this hill, and then I, there's my products, right? That little hill right there, if I have a catalyst, it'll get over it a little quick, a little easier, and the, rope, the trip is faster. And it's the same thing. If you're going over to Keystone, you go through Eisenhower Tunnel. Or if you want, you can take Loveland Pass. Mm -hmm. And you will get there faster this way, guaranteed. If there's no traffic, you will get there faster this way because you don't have to go up and over the hill and back down. True? So it lowers the energy. Now let's, the part I like to show students so they kind of go, that's okay, I get it. That's part one, it goes faster, and then part two is it's not used up. It can do it over and over and over again. That's important too. 
So whatever breaks this down, right, then it, it can be used over and over and over again, that catalyst can. Okay? And I, I want to just off the top of my head say it's some sort of ethanase, but that's not exactly right. I know that must be some sort of something. Dehydrogenase is what I'm guessing it is. Because it has the word ASE in the back side, and it, it kind of takes the hydrogen off, although it puts it back on. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. So now I've got all sorts of questions. I've just got myself with more questions than answers, but that's okay. And it's good for me to think about all this. You guys okay with that so far? Here's what we all know in this room, hopefully. Goes faster by lowering the energy, right? Because if you can lower the energy to make some, the braking forming, then it's going to go faster. And then it can be used over and over and over again. So, I'll just take another catalyst that we're probably, you're going to all relate to because you all, you all use this catalyst, every one of you, that, unless you don't drive a, a gas-powered vehicle. Some gas doesn't get burned, or diesel, same. And as it comes out the tailpipe, it would come out into the atmosphere and literally be dripping gas on the road. And that would be a disaster for the environment. So we actually have a catalyst in there, it's platinum, and what it does is it facilitates, all it needs is the heat of the muffler and it will burn the gas on the way out. So unused gas gets burned on the way out of the muffler and that way we don't have so much gas dripping out. So that's a catalytic converter. It uses a catalyst, platinum, to add oxygen onto the gasoline to turn it all to, you guys actually know this answer, carbon dioxide and water on the spot. And it doesn't need a match. It just is hot enough on the catalyst bed. It does it just like that. Why? Now this is the advanced part. But everybody's got this stuff. Does that make sense? What does it do? It burns it fast. Can be used over and over. It's a good thing. Because platinum's not cheap. Take whatever the price of gold is and double it, you might have platinum. I don't know. It's a, I don't know if it's double, but it's a lot more. So I certainly can't just use platinum every time I use a tank of gas. I can't like go, hey, you got some platinum to buy? It's like, oh my gosh, gas would cost $300 a milliliter. <laughs> It'd be ridiculous. And I, that's a, But it's used over and over and over for 20, 30 years as long as that muffler's in that car. Until some sneaky little jerk figured out, if I steal that, I can go resell it because it's worth a lot of money. And that's why you're losing your catalytic converters. I got one stolen, so I'm mad about it still. Anybody else had the muffler sent? Like, you turn on your car, it sounds like a lawnmower? Okay. Oh my gosh! That's so irritating. Okay, anyway. The whole neighborhood. Because they're stealing that <laughs> platinum and those precious metals out of there and reselling them. So, anyway, it's going to make me mad if you I put a little guard on there now, so. They have. Because the thing is, you could just, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down a trail. You could just zip it off like in two minutes. You just got this circular saw and just boop, boop, and the whole muffler comes out, and they're like, well, we'll figure it out later, and off you go. I think Subaru is covered in them. So what? I think Subaru is covered in Yeah, so, yeah, and, and if not, like my wife's car had a Prius, and those are actually load, extra loaded with platinum because they really wanted to be efficient. So everybody's going after them. So I just put a stainless steel guard over it. Go find one. Yeah. And then I amped No, I'm just kidding. I was thinking in my mind, I'm going to put like 220 volts on it too. But then I was like, I'll kill my mechanic. And he'd be like, what'd you do? <laughs> it's like, no, never mind. So I didn't do that. All right. So how are we doing on all this? I was rattling for a minute. but we're So now we're just going to the, bo the body and doing the same thing. So if my whole goal was to break apart a protein and make the amino acids right back, I could use a catalyst. If I didn't have it, it, would, it could happen over time with a lot of energy, which my body can't do. Like I might, I might have to like create the equivalent of starting a fire in there to break apart protein. I can't do that, right? So I have a catalyst that makes the breaking easier. Okay? So sometimes what I like to do is just kind of give a student, like, well, why does, how does it make it easier? I'll just show you a couple ideas. And that way you can at least kind of appreciate it, okay? Well, one of them is it, it might be such that it binds both pieces like this. 
So the catalyst itself, it might just actually get this. Remember, I got to break this. Okay, this guy's to come off. So it might specifically bind this, and it might specifically bind that. So here's the way that works. This is the electrons that hold this in a bond, correct? So now when I do that, now the electrons are kind of distributed across both of us now. It's kind of a same idea as my bank account when I had my first daughter. It was all right here. Her name's Kaziah, by the way. Kaziah, she would have had all the money right there to go to school. And then here came Tressa. Beep. All of a sudden, the money for Kaziah just got cut in half. Because now it's distributed this way. Then here came Kaylee. Kaylee Lane. And now it's like... Now it's a third of the energy. Does that make sense? It's called delocalization. But if you can kind of just generally understand that, you'll understand that a lot of the times when you look, there's the Pac-Man. The molecule I'm about to tear apart fits in there, like lock and key. But now we kind of understand what molecules look like, like the proteins we looked at, right? That big string. We drew some of them on the board. So now this enzyme looks like that, like, come to me. And it fits in there. Using things we've learned in this class, intermolecular bonds, hydrogen bonds, if it's a little bit of a hydrophobic, like it has a long hydrocarbon chain, this thing, this enzyme might have a hydrocarbon piece on it too that attracts that piece. So it all fits in there and it starts to, it starts to lessen the strength of the bonds that I'm about to break. So that means the hump I have to go over is lower now, right? If it's easier to break the bond. That makes sense? So the pre-break for like the catalyst for my car is literally taking the hydrocarbon chain and starting to weaken the carbon-carbon bonds. Because I know they're all breaking because I'm turning them all into anybody? Carbon dioxide. Every individual carbon in octane, all eight, gets turned into a single carbon dioxide. So if I pre-break them, the energy I have to go over is lower now. So I don't have to go crazy and like light it off in the cylinder where it explodes. It just touches the hot muffler and that's enough and it makes it happen. It takes a little less energy. Is that all making sense? Now the other thing it might do is preform. Okay, preforming. Like Get them in position to form. Okay, so in chemistry, this is uh, actually a pretty simple concept, again. So now we're like, okay, you know, I'm just going to say, okay, this is broken off. Here he is running around free in the, woohoo, right? In chemistry, this, this distance here might be equivalent to, okay, I broke these apart, and now this is traveling. This is in Littleton. Here, here, Littleton. There you go. And this guy's hanging out in Brimfield. Hey, how's it going? And we're like supposed to find each other. That's the probability that is now lower. That makes that reaction slower and it requires more energy because we got to run around by temperature and be like, are you there? Hello? Are you there? Oh, yes. Okay, then the reaction happens, correct? So a catalyst might just simply do this. Like, I got you, I got you. We are now close to each other. So the rate at which this happens is now statistically much faster than if you had been there and follow. So sometimes, again, pre-grabbing is that same idea. If, if I can get the two pieces that have to come together, the probability of them hitting is much higher. It's like a matchmaker. Yeah, it's a matchmaker. And that's, that's I'm, I'm just giving you, this is higher level stuff than you would know in 1009. But it's okay, because it kind of helps you solve it in your head. like. Why does it speed this up? Could pre-break bonds, could make the energy of finding each other easier by pre-positioning. And that, that's the other thing about it is, okay, so now we get this made. Doo -doo -doo. And the last step is this, right? This has to come on, right? The other thing is pre-positioning. Now, if this has to attach here, and this thing's spinning freely in the body. Woo -hoo! It's like, if, oh, ooh, I, that's a miss. Oh, that's a miss. Right? It's the right place, but it's on the wrong side. And then finally, it's like, ah, oh, <laughs> finally, reaction, right? Well, what if the substrate, what we call the, the enzyme, 
is literally going like, hold still. Here, you take over here about, hold still. Now, now it's easier to hit the spot, right? And that's sometimes what these catalysts do. They preposition. They literally go and hold the active site exposed. Okay? And that, that's how it happens. I, you know, I sometimes tell stories about my big brother when, the, when I think of this example. I had two of them. I was the youngest. Did I tell you that? Playing darts? How we play darts? It went like this. They'd get darts and they go run. And I'm like, what? Oh my gosh! And they're like, that's how we play darts. I know it sounds cruel, doesn't it? But you know, you get tough on your little brother, I guess. <laughs> or fast. Something. <laughs> now, sometimes my big brother acted like a catalyst because he would go and hold me and I was just like ah and then my other brother would be like oh this is easy now right and it's like oh my gosh it really wasn't as cruel as it seems so but it bad. seemed that way one of those darts like like just kind of hanging right just like on the inner you know like just hanging off my skin I go to my mom like ah they hit me in the heart I'm gonna die and she's like don't bleed on my carpet get out of here right it's like what go play with your brothers those jerks but anyway you, you with me that's the same thing that prepositioning it makes it a lot easier to make that connection although that was dark you probably don't want to think about that too much but okay where am I at? I lost my little clicker all right that's a lot of talk about enzymes but I just want you to appreciate what we're talking about and the take-home was very simple reused over and over and over to do the exact same reaction speeds it up speeds it up that's the key it's time but you're right by lowering the energy to make the reaction happen that's kind of those go hand in hand all right so now we're going to get a few of these names in here we've done this in class the last time we were together we talked about this there's that repeating amide what is that thing called repeating amide repeating amide Polyamide, specifically though of our biolo correct by the way, of our biological groups, lipid, protein, carbohydrate, which one is it? This is the protein. This thing breaks apart proteins and turns them into this is amino acid, right? So we call it a protease. The ASE is always your clue that it's a catalyst. So I could cleave proteins into amino acids, but it would take some work and some energy and stuff that I don't have. So I have this enzyme that basically starts to pre-break the amide bonds. Because they're hard to break, they're very strong. So uh, this you can pick up the, and we're going to get you where you just look. If I say the name, you can kind of guess what it's breaking apart or putting together. Okay? So here's that. So I made some notes optimal positioning, pre breaking, and I mentioned the other thing. It could also be uh, pre forming, right? Making the reaction, the forming easier. Here's a general energy thing. This is just sometimes helps me out. If I'm breaking, that requires energy. If I'm making, it releases energy. That's a good, that's a rule of thumb in chemistry that's correct. Breaking bonds requires energy. Making bonds kicks energy out. So my reaction had both breaking and making. Correct? I broke the, al the, o the H off the alcohol, but then I remade a double bond, and then I remade a hydrogen bond, right? Together, how those sum up, it could either be require energy, it could kick off energy overall. It depends about the strength of the energy required. All right, so here we go. And this is what I was just saying. It lowers activation energy. So, you know, this is the little picture I was talking about was this is it. This is the substrate is basically the reaction. So in our case, this is the protein. I'm just trying to get the protein into little amino acids. That's all I'm trying to do. And if I didn't have this catalyst, it would be this much energy to get over the hump. It would take a while. But this thing 
prepositions it on there, that's the enzyme. Which means those amide bonds are now getting weak, right? And now, that, because those bonds are easier to break, doo -doo -doo, I get the same product. And then this is ready to go do it all over again and keep doing it. That makes sense? There's the things we're like, I've seen these pictures, right? In biology, and like, do, do, is, am I full of Pac Man? What are, <laughs> no. Well, you now know what they are a little more complicated looking. stuff my pre-break bonds my pre-make pre-formed bonds this is kind of getting a little closer to more realistically what it looks like right it's that they're kind of globs remember how we talked about that proteins fold back up into that what kind of structure is that when it gets into the ball tertiary it gets into that tertiary structure and sometimes that tertiary structure is just right for accepting a substrate but again, I don't want to mislead you. Not every enzyme is full protein. Sometimes it's protein-like. We'll see some structures here before long. That's okay. All right, so let's get what else, whatever else we got. Oh, let's get some words. Okay, okay you ready? The substrate is what the molecule I'm working on. The substrate's the, the business end. So the protease, the substrate is protein. It's the target. Okay? So we call it a substrate. So an enzyme substrate complexes, oh, that substrate has now found its way to the enzyme. And usually there's something on there called an active site. That'll come up here in the next slide, I think. But basically that space where that fits, that's called the active site. It's usually, because of these forces we've learned about, hydrogen bonds, dispersion, dipoles, it fits for that target substrate. So just a few things. We're going to look for the word ASE or the ending ASE, and that's our clue that it's probably an enzyme. Lactase, whatever. We, we just did peptidase, right? So for example, Sugar's into this suffix O's, like lactose, right? But if I have something that's supposed to take apart lactose, I would call it's lactase. What do you think sucrase does? I think this one's in your mouth. This is the IV one. It's in your saliva and tears apart. Okay. Yeah, but very specifically though, if it's called sucrase, what is it tearing apart? Sucrose, the table sugar, the white stuff, remember? Disaccharide, table sugar, just the white, we actually have one for that. Which then, you know, that means that uh, sucrose is not unnatural. Sometimes we get that impression like table sugar is all man made. It's like that's not true, or else it wouldn't have an enzyme for it. It's just, too much for of it in your mouth, right? Causes problems, right? That's the, we don't need that environment for the bacteria that also will chew it up. Correct. So cool. What do you think a lipase takes apart? What is that LIP? What, what are we on our way to? Lipid. Oh yeah, it takes apart fats. Ooh, I need some more of that. Lipase. What bike riding does, it's a light base. But anyway, that's a side note, right? Now there are a couple uh, exceptions that I want you to be familiar with because these show up. We talked about them a little bit. These are digestive enzymes, and particularly for lipids as well. Trypsin, chymotrypsin, and pepsin end up being enzymes in your, your gut for fats. So those are unique. Now beyond that, the name might tell the reaction. Now some of that won't mean anything to you because you haven't totally done much with it. Like oxidase catalyzes an oxidation reaction. And you may not know what an oxidation reaction is per se, right? So that's why that might be confusing. We've only learned one in here where we basically said um, 
So oxidation in organic chemistry could be either removing oxygen or adding hydrogen. So the ones we've actually learned are adding hydrogen. So we take our um, carbonyl, uh, carbonyl group, or carboxyl, what is that thing called? It's an aldehyde or ketone in the sugar, right? And that particular group, we add hydrogen on it and becomes an alcohol. And those are sugar alcohols. Those were how we made stuff like sorbitol. Do you remember that a little bit? We said, oh yeah, actually, if I oxidize sorbitol, the the sugar sucro, or glucose, it will turn into a sugar alcohol. And the sugar alcohols don't get digested the same way as the alcohol, the actual sugars do. So just, that was a long way of saying it's making the stuff in my gum that actually isn't a sugar, so therefore it doesn't interact with the bacteria in my mouth. Although it tastes sweet, it's close enough that my receptors get tricked. They go, here's a sugar, and then the thing that takes it apart, sucre says, I don't know what to do with this. So it passes on by. Right? So those were sugar alcohols. But anyway, that was a long way of saying, hey, if something undergoes an oxidation reaction, it might be called an oxidase. If you have a hydrolysis reaction, which we've talked about as well, it might be called a hydroxyl, a hydrolase. Okay? So what do you think glucose oxidase does? Takes this molecule, which is yeah, which is also a sugar, right? Right? So it's the sugar we use for energy, and it oxidizes it, glucose oxidase. Does that make sure? What what do you think I'm putting on to pyruvate, whatever that is, when I use this word? What what is the chemical atom that I'm adding on to pyruvate? Carbon. Carboxylate. What do you think I'm taking off of this susunate when I call it a dehydrogenase? Taking off a hydrogen. That's kind of the idea. And lactose breaks apart lactose into usable glucose. What enzyme are you missing if you're lactose intolerant? Lactase. Lactase. There you go. It's a common name. Okay. So enzymes are specific to a certain molecule shape. So now we'll get back into these figures, which are not really like this, right? We now know, oh, wait a second. I'm taking a protein, which really is like amide, 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 the side groups. So these could be very, if, if this was the lock and key model, the side groups are probably the keys to what this substrate looks like. Right? So if I have a, a, you know, some sort of something that does something, a tryptophan, for example, it probably has a side group affinity, like it's shaped such that it would accept that particular side group. So we're just using a simple five by saying, well, it fits. So what do we got? Here's the enzyme. Right? See, there's the enzyme. Here's the substrates. So this takes two substrates. This is one that's putting things together. So this and this need to add. So let's just say they're two different amino acids. Right, so I'm taking two amino acids, I'm putting them together into the protein. So they get in here, it fits just right so that they're side by side, they're proximal. Then the energy to make the bond is a little lower and then here comes the product. Does that make sense? Now you'll hear different things. You'll hear what they call lock and key hypothesis and then what's called the induced fit model. And we don't need to get into all that. It's just basically biochemists say, well, lock and key, does it exactly already look like these two amino acids? Like exactly, so they fit just right? Or as they start to approach it, do they make the shape of the amino acid incoming? That's all this means. And we'll just leave it at that for you guys. Not whether this is what it predominantly does, not you know arguments about it. Who's doing that when? No, that's too much biochemistry for all of us, myself included. I don't know much about this stuff. I mean, I understand the general idea that I'm showing you. If it's a lock and key, it's already pre-made to the proper shape. If it's induced, it's induced as the amino acids or whatever is approaching it. And then it becomes, so it doesn't quite fit until it gets close, then it fits just right. 
So that's kind of what that means. So that could be something you could put in your definitions, say the difference between lock and key, pre-made shape, and induced fit. Shape is made as the substrate approaches. The shape literally responds to the approaching substrate. Right? And that's kind of like a catcher's mitt, right? If you've ever seen people playing baseball, like a first baseman or whatever, that mitt's like this when he's sitting there hanging out. When the ball's on its way, it's like, wait a second, <laughs> I'm getting ready for this, right? That's an induced fit. Lacrosse is a little different. Anybody seen lacrosse, right? That basket's the same. So it's already ready. There's no change, it's just ready, right? All the time. So that would be lock key. That'd be lock and key. That's a good one. Cool. All right. Now, some enzymes require assistance. Okay. This we're going to use, again, it's going to be kind of general, but then hopefully this will start to make some sense. We'll spend a little time with this. All right. Yeah, we're doing for time. So they're called, now the, the slides kind of point towards what we call co coenzymes and sometimes call them prosthetic groups. This, this is to, to me, it takes a minute, so I was trying to look for a word that kind of brought it all together. I think in mod modern biochemistry we use the term cofactor that covers everything. So you'll hear different words though. You'll hear coenzyme, which is a cofactor. What does it mean? It works together with the enzyme. Different ways it works along with it. Okay? So cofactors do something additional. Maybe they're part of the pre-breaking, maybe they're part of the post-forming, maybe they're the one that makes the actual bond form once everything's in place. Okay, so maybe the enzyme places everything, but the cofactor actually facilitates that. So this would be common in like, say, I know my liver has some digestive enzymes. Once something lands in there, right, it's like, this is bad. I don't want this. Like that aldehyde we just talked about. Once it lands there, then the cofactor comes in and copper or whatever and goes, I'm going to split this bond and just, pfft. now we'll just send it to the bathroom. True. <laughs> All right. Does that make sense? So the cofactor may do the work, but the enzyme still might be do the thing that fits it and attracts the big molecule you're working on. So in this model, I basically have a substrate I'm going to break apart. Right? That goes in there. But in order for it to work properly, I also have to have this other coenzyme piece. And I'm not explaining exactly you know, what it does. I don't know. But I would say that the enzyme is more for fitting, right? It's more uh, attractive for the pieces, but the co coenzyme is doing something to make the bond break. Just in this picture. All right? Now, the reason I bring this up is these things might be familiar to you. You're like, oh, I need some zinc in my diet. I need some iron in my diet. I need copper. I need cobalt in my diet. Not much. So what does that indicate to me? If I don't need much, but I have to have it. That, that could be the, the sign of it's in an enzymatic cycle because it can be reused over and over and over. So with that very little amount, it must be able to be do things over and over. And this is just case in point because if I need zinc in my diet, but yet I go, okay, good, I'm gonna go get, you know, I'm gonna go scrape off some nails, and, like get all the zinc off the cup and I'm gonna just swallow it, then I'm heading to the hospital and be sick. And if I eat enough of it, it might, you know, put me underneath the ground. Might be pushing up da daisies, that's not good. So it's like, what, how is that? Even like iron, I need iron in my diet. Yeah, well, if you get too much, then you could have another problem. So I only need a little trace amount, right? So that's like, wow, how does that work? That's an indicator, it's probably something part of an enzymatic cycle that I need very little. Kind of like my muffler. I need very little platinum. Why? Because I want the car to be something I can afford. <laughs> right? 
I don't want the muffler to be worth fifty thousand dollars for my little, you know, Prius, right? So I, if I get a little trace amount, it'll be it, that'll do me because it can do the reaction over and over and over and over again. But you've probably heard of these things being in your diet, right? Need more zinc, need more copper. You guys are like, man, I'm having problems pro processing oxygen. They're like, oh, you need more iron in your diet, right? But that can be used over and over. So that's one of the, the clues. And then there might be other small organic molecules that are known as coenzymes, vitamins. A lot of the vitamins you take are actually coenzymes. So there are small organic molecules that are part of your diet that make something happen. Okay, whoa, here, here we go, here's some vitamins. So here's vitamin B1. Now let's do the some let's do some tearing apart on here. Ooh, I should have done this, but I didn't. I'm gonna give you a little homework with this. This piece. So what do you see in there out of your functional group table? Parts that look familiar. And then things that are even from or, uh, inorganic chemistry, just the polyatomic ions we've learned. Anything familiar on some of these? So we'll start with this guy. You see anything in here? Lots of these. Here's an NH2. Here's an N triple bonds. Ends with all triple bonds, carbon nitrogen. What do we call those things? Kind of the same thing. What? Is it triple bond? Yeah, so they're, they're nitrogen with bonds to them, right? They have NH2s on them. What group is that? Functional group? Any luck? I hope it's in the sheet somewhere. How about this? You see it? It's an amine, right? So see how there's RRR and some of the R's are R prime? They say that could also be hydrogen. So I look at this. I know that's harder to see in here, but it's oh, these are these could either be carbons or hydrogens. These are all carbons, but here's one that's carbon with two hydrogens, right? These are all just called amine groups. But they're double bonded. And and even being double bonded is kind of still fits within that group. So I good point. Fair enough, right? This is a little odd. But this one's a for sure amine, right? See this one? This would be a for sure. Yeah, there's an amine. What about this if you put a sulfur in the middle between two carbons? Sulfide. Sulfide. Good. These from our more, this is more of our polyatomic ions. You might recognize this as phosphorus with four O's. Polyatomic ion. That's a phosphate group. So that's interesting. Uh, some of the parts, right? None, none of these, I mean, it's like, whoa, is that a nucleic acid? No. Close, but I don't have alcohols. I don't have, I don't have the ribose. I don't have. The, I kind of have a base-looking thing, but it, it looks familiar. But nothing that we've learned, right? So this is why I say like enzymes, coenzymes. I'm not going to have you identify them by structure, right? But this is vitamin B1. Here's vitamin B6. What's in this structure? Look at that guy. What's that? It's got a phosphate, it's got aldehyde, got this, alcohol, so it's kind of unique. Oh my gosh, look at this monster, vitamin B12, cyanocobalamin, holy crap, look, it's got cobalt in the center, that's got the C triple bond in, the cyanide group hanging out in there. Lots of, oh, what are these? C double bond N, amides? Crazy. All right, so these are coenzymes. Better yet, we're going to call them cofactors. That's proper. And what does that mean? There's certain enzymatic reactions. These need to be present to make them happen. That's a common point of environment. So we're going to work on this table a little bit. I'm going to actually give you a little homework with it. And what I'm going to have you do is just kind of refill in this next slide so you can kind of visit all these. Okay, I'm going to give you that, and then we'll take a break. Just something for you to think about. And so what I'm going to do is, this is going to be the first time we do this. We usually don't have, like, paper and pencil homework, right? So I'll just give you this to work on. 
I'm going to have you just go back through the same list, fill it in so you can just kind of get an idea of, hey, if I talk about V1, it assists in glucose metabolism, which means it somehow converts glucose to something, right? That's all metabolism means. It, it's a point of making glucose or breaking glucose. And we know what glucose does, right? What does it do? Sugar. It's energy. It fuels cells, right? Wow, it's also part of all this different synthesis. So when I'm making an RNA strand, this is a vitamin is part of the enzymatic reaction that starts to build that DNA strand, like builds the actual strand strand. So that's kind of interesting. So you'll read some of these. A lot of them have to do with making amino acids, uh, breaking apart cholesterol. Manganese is part of that. Bone formation, cool. Now, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you kind of just visit all those, so that's simple. It'll just give you that idea. And out of those, I want you to pick one that just catches your eye, and you're like, oh, that's very interesting. So I'm gonna have you do one out of this top group, which is more of the bigger um, organic molecules, or bigger biomolecules, right? And the bottom one, which is pretty much as simple, atoms. Like, why do I need sulfur in my body? Well, there you go. It's part of making sulfur-containing amino acids, like thiamine, right? Does that make sense? Or, oh, chromium. Oh my gosh, chromium's deadly poisonous, chromium-3, right? But yet I need some, because it helps with somehow proteins either breaking apart or going together. All I want you to do with the, whatever one's of interest to you, you've got to just pick one from below and one from above, write it, uh, a layman's paragraph of how that works. So you'll have to help, you'll hit, as if you explain it to your, your brother, not, not little brother, brothers that were old enough to really understand things, right? Just help them understand. Okay, glucose metabolism. You'll have to kind of, okay, glucose is a molecule that helps me with cellular energy, right? It makes me, powers my, right? You're gonna have to get into words like that and just say, well, how in the heck does this thiamine work with that? The best you can. And it just do the best you can, and it'll get you thinking about it. So just reword it in a very simple paragraph. One paragraph for each. Does that make sense? So there's that assignment. And then when you're done, it goes the same place that you're going to put your, um, not the exact same slot, but in assignment. You just upload this. Now, if you like this to start electronically, it's already on the shelf. Like you just want to just download the word and then just type into it and then upload it for your final answer. Awesome. Sound good? One little catch to that though is I do need to kind of have you try and do the, the molecule. So, you know, if you're feeling like you like to do these chemicals, that's awesome. If you love chemicals, then pick this one. Because then you can draw it, and that would be awesome. Trying to reproduce it. That's fine. And by the way, I'll give you another uh, a thing if you don't know it. If you have them, uh, sorry for you Mac owners, I don't think this is legit. But if you have a PC, you can download something called ChemSketch. And it'll actually allow you to like produce the molecule structure, just like I do for your quizzes. Where you can actually, oh, I got off there. Where you can actually just, produce these structures. So that's cool. But if not, you can hand draw. And, and you can upload that in a separate scan in the same spot. Is that okay? Pretty simple. There's that. Everybody got one? We need this row. And then you guys have... Yeah, for Kayla, did I give you this yet already? Okay. All right, away we go. Time is going short. Oh, that's the one I already filled in. That's the best one. Yeah, I don't keep that. No. <laughs> Thank you. All right, cool. All right, so that'll be something for you to work on, and it's going to have a, a pretty, you know, it has a plenty of time to work with. So we'll watch a little, a little film about enzymes with the Amoeba Sisters. This is pretty cool, but I think it's good. I think it's worth the kind of revisiting.
I just want to point out that this, and I mentioned it, but I just want to make sure so you're not confused, because I'm not going to be trying to pin you down to this, but it's very um, disputed how they're doing this. Coenzyme, cofactor, um, you know, that they all kind of fit. Some of the some of the literature says, well, if you use cofactor, that it, that's the big term that blankets everything. And so I'm just trying to tell you that I'm using the term cofactor generically as something that works alongside. And you'll hear you'll hear, hear things like prosthetics, or you'll hear things like coenzymes within that. But they're doing it a little differently. She's basically going. A little simpler, they're going, okay, usually cofactors are typically metal, coenzymes are the organic molecules. Fair enough. I'm just trying to say there's a little bit, bit of dispute. So we're going to stick with cofactors, but just when you hear it interchangeably, I'm not going to pin you down to what exactly is a coenzyme versus a cofactor versus a prosthetic versus a. Is that okay? Is that okay? Just we don't have enough. Uh, Time nor energy. That's. I mean, it's not that. It's not that well spent. They may bind. So here's another concept. This is called inhibitors. This is if you want to hijack an enzy enzymatic path, then you might get something get that gets in the way. So, you know, if this is a normally acting enzyme, so I got a substrate. Here's the enzyme. When it's done, this thing falls apart, right? So this must be some sort of decomposition type reaction, right? An inhibitor would actually fit in the site, and then when this substrate comes in, it has no place to attach. So that's just, again, we're using very oversimplified figures, right? But sometimes in drug design, what they're doing is they're saying, well, I don't want this enzy enzymatic reaction to happen anymore, or especially like if it had been a problem. Let's just say that there's something that's gone haywire, like the normal enzymatic production of something is overproducing, and you want to just hijack it and stop it from working. You might design a drug that looks a lot like the substrate, but doesn't quite function, so it just kind of plugs the receptor and doesn't do what it's supposed to. And so now that receptor is out, and so the production of something stops. Does that kind of make sense? So you could have. Uh, competitive inhibitors, this is the, kind of the same idea about inducement, but it's a little different in that it just, you know, this is kind of lock and key, but this is different, like the uh, inhibitor fits somewhere else on the enzyme, and when it does, it, it changes the enzyme enough so it will no longer accept the substrate. So it can happen one of two ways, directly in the site, somewhere on the backside that affects the site, and that's kind of how those might work very straightforward, competitive and non-competitive inhibition or inhibitors. And then a lot of painkillers are actually inhibitors. So this is, oh excuse me, this is a very uh, kind of a cool chart, but it's all set relative to morphine. So if morphine's kind of the baseline of how you deal with pain. So the idea is this, you know, something happens, you start a pain pathway, and the reason is, is then that makes your whole, that whole area sensitized. So if I have injury, right, somewhere, oh, there I am, I got injury going here. So I got injury, then I have a certain pain pathway around that, and that's on purpose, because it feels pain, and then I'm babying it, right? The pain is what protects it. So I'm like, before I'd be real rough with my hands, but this area, I'm like, oh, because every time I get around it, I start feeling pain, so I'm like, oh, so it could be good, but sometimes, like in the mouth, it gets out of hand, correct? So we might take something that what we're doing is we're shutting down the pain pathway. So it's an enzymatic cascade that creates that pain pathway. And so what we're going to do is inhibit the site. And that's what these are all about. So the way you kind of read this, if you want to understand it, just look at some of it, is they basically say if morphine is you know, pain relief on the scale of one, then if you go to tramadol, it's a tenth as effective. Stuff like ibuprofen is like, 300s as effective, just in terms of like per gram, right? But it's wild when you go up on, on this level, you can get all the way to fentanyl, which is 
80 to 100 times as effective as morphine. And that's the problem with this stuff is fentanyl was, you know, it's a medicine, it's a great, it's a wonder drug. It's just that it takes very, very little. To kill you. And it's also very addictive. And so the, the thing that happened is on the street, people started lacing fentanyl in with their other street drugs going, well, if they taste this, they're going to want more and more. And it's also going to be highly effective, but because the, the dosage is so small, it's easy to overdose. So basically, that's what's happening. You know, overdose of painkiller and killing people. So fentanyl itself is not deadly. It's just that it has to be prescribed medically at very, very low dosage. Does that make sense? And it's highly addictive. So drug dealers were basically just using it to get people hooked so they keep coming back for more and over, overdoing it. But anyway, this is kind of a cool chart. And you can look at it, but basically all of that is, and they talk a little bit about, the, some of them say the precise, Mode of action unknown. Well, generally, what that means, and that's not, I, I wish that wasn't in there necessarily. But basically, you have an opiate receptor, which is that same sort of thing. That receptor site is what blocks the pain. So, in general, opioids attract to that sensor. So, it, same idea. It just inhibits, blocks the pain. You're like, oh, I don't feel the pain anymore. This is awesome. The problem with opioids is they're a little bit addictive. They trigger other side reactions that kind of stimulate you to kind of want more. Um, anyway, this is kind of a, a, a chart that when you look at it, you can kind of look at things you're familiar with, like ibuprofen, um, aspirin. And I don't know if I've got good old, I actually don't have like uh, a set of fentanyl on there, which is just like um, Tylenol, but anyway. Do you see it on there? Paracetamol. Oh, paracetamol. Oh, yeah. Yeah, paracetamol. Oh, wow. I didn't know that was a pharmaceutical for that. As I was used to calling it a set of fentanyl. So there it is. Cool. All right. So those are all inhibition. So now I'll let the, I'll let the Amoeba sisters teach for another minute. go. Shall we do it? Shall we push on? Get done? Yes? Okay. Then we can just kind of get into the view mode and get back together. So uh, the last part is kind of the bigger picture of just talking about the met metabolic cat pathway, of which there are hundreds in our body, right? So these are literally full pathways that run through and do certain functions. So one of the things we're going to just generalize is we're going to just say, look, if larger mo molecules get broken into smaller molecules, we'll probably call that catabolism. And then if it's smaller molecules binding together, we're going to end up making larger molecules. That's called anabolism. And so I'd like you just to generally know those terms. So we'll just look at it in a very general sense. So one of the um, most obvious sorts of catabolism is digestion, which basically means that you're going to take molecules, and as you start to digest them, you'll start to break them apart. So saliva contains starch digesting enzymes, which, by the way, we got the name of that today. Did anybody pick that up from the videos? They can't showed up twice. We talked about it before. It breaks apart starch. Amylase. So you might jot that down in your notes. Amylase will break apart starch, which is amylose, right? And we did, you know, pepsin, trypsin takes part polypeptides, i.e. the proteins. We did the lipase taking apart lipase. Uh, 
lipids, and then we did also sucrase and lacto lactase, taken apart like glucose or sucrose and and lactose, right? So that's that sort of thing. And it may not all be enzymes. Some of this stuff is actually like stomach acids contain like enzymes, but they also contain a lot of HCl, just an acid to destroy things. And the idea is that you get them small enough that they can pass the intestinal membrane in the bloodstream. And then on the other side, you can have anabolism where you start to put them back together. <clears throat> so this part I would just like to point out, it's kind of a good review question or something to think about is, if you have large carbohydrates, disaccharides or polysaccharides, our usual goal for breaking them apart is gonna be into smaller glucose or other monosaccharides. Does that make sense? So that if you're looking at disaccharides or polysaccharides like starch, right? Or glycogen, which is this kind of the same thing as starch is just made by our own body, right? Then we'll break it apart to get to just simple glucose and monosaccharides. You break apart proteins, end up with amino acids. And if you have fats and oils, the ones we've learned, we're breaking apart into fatty acids. In glycerol. These can be reassembled. And we've talked about that a little bit, that I can actually build my own proteins. I can build my own um, polysaccharides. That's glycogen, right? You can take glucose, reassemble them to long-term storage. I can build my own lipids. I can build my own phospholipid cell walls and all that off of the simple carbohydrates, or I'm sorry, fatty acids, right? I can reassemble. So that's called anabolism. And then the last kind of, the only cycle we're gonna even dip into a little bit is we're gonna just talk about metabolism of the glucose molecule. This is, takes place in the uh, mitochondria, right? I think you get that a lot in biology, correct? So out of this, the only thing we're gonna do is um, just kind of get this idea that there is a reaction, and you'll see that in here that you basically start off with the sugar. Now that's C6H12O6, but I could draw those structures, right? And you go, okay, I got four carbons, and suddenly when I start to draw this, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I start looking at this and go, oh, okay, this is, and whatever side I put these on, I'm not gonna have that correct, but. Right, and then we go in here and goes, there's two, and then this goes off and makes another alcohol down here, correct? Oh. That's where they're getting that C6, H12O6, which basically is, that's familiar to you when you see it this way, right? It's a sugar. And they're saying whenever you burn a sugar, you react it with oxygen and water. And it's interesting that what you make is carbon dioxide and water. It's like burning a hydrocarbon, isn't it? your body is in essence doing an electrochemical event that looks a lot like just putting a match to a hydrocarbon. You're making CO2 and water. And that's what releases energy. Now the interesting thing is if you looked at a similar like um, photosynthesis, you would basically be looking in reverse. You would be able to take in CO2 and water into the plant and it would turn it back into sugar. And then we consume the sugar and we turn it back around, right? So we're kind of working together that way. So the only keys to this is, um, you know, we know that the glucose comes in at the, on the mito, in the mi beginning of what we call the mito, what goes on in this uh, whole metabolism. And on the very end, we're really making these, what we call ATPs, that's the key. So we're actually gonna break glucose down a little bit differently. It's not just like this directly. Like it just goes and starts burning, we make this. It goes through steps. 
Some of these have uh, in coenzymes, they have enzymes, there's long complicated cycles. But the point of it, all of it is, is as glucose comes in, we start kicking out all these ATPs. And that's how we're going to simplify it in this class. So then if you look at adenosine triphosphate, so this is the adenosine, and here's the triphosphate. It looks very similar like to a nucleic acid, right? because it has all the parts, it's got a base, it's got a, a ribose sugar, and then it's got the triphosphates on it. But the idea is that if you think about these negative uh, phosphates, they don't really necessarily like each other, right? So I'm gonna pop those free, cleave one of those by adding water across the bottom. That's a very familiar theme in the body, right? Does that make sense? So I'm going to add water across the bond in the form of, what is this H plus? Acid and base, right? Water can disassociate, right? So that's not common, right? Water not just doesn't disassociate on its own. So you need some sort of enzyme for that. We're going to break the water apart. It adds across the bond. And I'm going to basically put the um, proton on one side, the alcohol on the other. So now I'm just breaking this out. I'm just trying to show you where it adds exactly, right? I'm going to take this phosphate here, cleave it, bring it over, put the H plus there, and then the remainder has the alcohol or the OH on it, the hydroxide. So now this is a denison diphosphate. So ATP turns into ADP, and the point is it releases energy. Now this can be a little confusing because I already just said, hey, if we're, if we're breaking bonds, that requires energy. If we make bonds, that releases energy, correct? So you might go look at this and go, wait a second, I broke a bond and it released energy. So that's kind of the opposite of what you just said. True? But the truth of the matter is I also made two bonds. I made this bond and I made this. And the other unique thing about that is there is a repulsive force. Like originally I had a bunch of negatives packed together. And once I pack those negatives together and they release, that releases energy. So this is a very unique, like this is where I would say, be careful chemistry biology when you're running between the two fields. Because you'll look at this and go, wait, this is a bond breaking event that releases energy. Well, yeah, but it's a very special one. One is, don't forget, you also made two new bonds, right? I had to attach this hydroxide onto this phosphorus piece, and I also had to attach this hydrogen onto this phosphate piece. That's making bonds. So if sometimes if the energy of the making is greater than the energy of the breaking, it's going to be a net release of energy. Sometimes that's easier if you think of it this way. I just do it with a graph. Here's where I start. And I go, here's my ATP. I'm going to be breaking bonds. That takes energy in. True? I'm going to be making bonds and pushing negatives apart from each other. So energy-wise, I went from, let's say it was 70 kilojoules, and I dropped down to 40 kilojoules. Does that make sense? Even though I had to pump in maybe an extra 20 to get up to here, it all comes back out. So I go, oh, I lost 30 kilojoules to get from here to here. Just the same as if I had a car and I pushed it to the top of the hill and I go, oh my gosh, that was hard work, right? But when I roll down, I, but when I get here, I got all that energy back. Plus some. And that's why I release energy overall. So in this case, yes, you break bonds, but you also reform. And you, you take two negatives and pop them apart, if that makes sense. And I don't have, I wish I had some magnets I could show you. But you guys understand, if I put two north poles together, they would repulse. If I let go of them, they just pop apart, correct? And that's the idea that we have here.
I have a very, I'll back up. Right, these are three negative areas. They're all phosphates, they're all minus. So they want to get apart from each other. And I at least get one apart when I make the new product. Right? Now I pop that phosphate off. Does that help a little bit? So, so if I was you, I would be going, okay, well, what do I need to know out of this, right? The, uh, the original thing is glucose that goes in and it makes all the ATPs. This is taking it a step further and saying in your actual cell activity, ATP becomes ADP to release energy. That's the energy you literally use in the cell. So if you're thinking about the cell, the actual like, you know, here's the fireplace that everything gets around and goes, oh, this is what's keeping my body warm. It's this reaction, not really glucose. But it's kind of why when you look at the big picture overall, you kind of have a factory glucose comes in and on the other side the ATPs come out and you're like, where did those come from? Very complicated cycles and enzymes. Questions? Kind of understand what you're getting out of this? Um, I think from time to time on the final, et cetera, we do ask like kind of the, kind of the rough number. But basically what we say in here is that um, for every glucose you get 36 ATPs. And that gets argued around a little bit. And then ATP to AT ADP creates energy. Okay? And you guys act like it's time to go. Probably because it is. But don't go too fast. If anybody needs office hours, make sure you come in. And don't forget this part. You guys are done. Like, good job. Yeah, clap for yourself. You're like, done, done. Yeah, like, okay. Don't get, okay, how about this? Good job, me. There you go. Give yourself a little, like, dang. You do have homework. You have a few assignments. But if you start working on this, we're finishing up. Sound good? Awesome. I will come back. I'll, I'll, I'll still keep meeting you. Don't worry. <laughs>